Greetings, Kerbinauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number two of the Remastered Gateway Project, in which we'll begin with the launch of the next ISS replica module called Node 1, also known by its common name, the Unity Module. We should be waiting for the launch center to come under the orbit of the first module that we sent up last time, the FGB, but it doesn't seem that that's what I did. When I first did the Gateway series, I had never had a space station in an inclined orbit before, and I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, and I didn't have a lot of experience doing that and launching to one. Over time, I realized that I really liked it a lot. It adds a certain extra challenge, but not too much challenge so that it would be frustrating or anything. So what should have happened is we move the camera up and down to get the orbit on the front of Kerbin to line up with the orbit on the back of Kerbin and then both lines will overlap and we get them over the launch site. Instead you can see I launched too soon. This means we need to target our apoapsis to meet on or to hit, so to speak, the FGB's orbit. It also means extra fuel will be spent once we get there on the inclination change maneuver. You can see here that if we went along the equator, then a full 51 degree change would be needed once we hit the target orbit. But at least it seems I had thought ahead enough to change the inclination a little bit and target ahead on the orbit. By coming in further up, the cost of the change can be reduced. And the further ahead we go, the more it can be reduced. Now if this were real life, it would have been December 4th, 1998. Real Unity was launched on Space Shuttle Endeavor, the 13th mission for that shuttle of the 25 total missions it would fly. Endeavor was the fifth of the five shuttles built. The Kerbals didn't use a shuttle for this launch for the reason I explained in episode one. They don't know about the shuttles. They only know about the ISS plans that were salvaged from the alternate universe. And so they're using all their own launchers for all of these missions. If you want to see a shuttle launch Unity, I did a real solar system version of this launch that you can watch separately. Here on Kerbin, you can see how my orbit is beginning to reach out toward that FGB orbit, and I'm keeping my apoapsis and my descending node together, so both nodes will touch the FGB's orbit at the same time. Meanwhile, down on the surface, someone was using this launch as a diversion to sneak onto the base. Alright, so... What can I say? Let's start with my name. I'm Joseph Kerman, and I'm leaving this recording in case my mission tonight fails. Something must be done to stop this project or else all of Kerbin will be at risk. I've done what I can peacefully, but they're continuing with the construction anyway. I plan to plant a virus in their main computer to sabotage their systems and slow down development. It will hopefully buy us some extra time to get the project canceled. I hope no one gets hurt, but that would still be better than the destruction of the solar system. Meanwhile, Node 1 has reached orbit and is fast approaching the FGB for docking. There are six docking ports, and we've also brought two PMAs with us. That's two pressurized mating adapters. I have them stacked on one end and a space tug docked to the other end. Well, actually, let's look at this more closely in the VAB. We're launching on the KLS-4, the 2.5 meter expanded fairing launcher. I covered that in episode one, so we'll go straight into the fairing here. You can see there's a space tug down on the bottom. It's loaded with RCS and RCS ports, and actually way too much RCS in my opinion now. But hey, this was two to three years ago, so what can I say? It also has four big gyros, and if I were doing this today in real solar system, I'd probably use no gyros at all for the realism part of it. But okay, once again, two to three years ago. Oh, how things have changed. So, all right, this is currently docked to one of the four Unity ports and attached by cubic struts and breakable struts. Once Bob can get up to the station, we'll be able to use Kerbal Attachment System to remove the cubic struts and reduce our part count. We'll put them in a box and deorbit them. All along the tug and the Unity module, we have lights. 
gorgeous, gorgeous lights, because you gotta have more lights. The body of Unity is one welded piece, and each PMA is one welded piece. Later, I'll switch to proper looking PMAs, but for now, it's these ugly monsters that I remember causing me all kinds of trouble because I didn't know how to weld docking ports properly back then. Oh, if I only knew then what I know now, but alas. Anyway, let's get back to orbit. The real Unity was of course attached by robotic arm, but if you've ever used a robotic arm in KSP to dock something, then you know why I'm not using a robotic arm on my missions. Instead, I use the space tug to move everything into position. It has two docking ports, one type to simulate the common berthing port, and one type to represent the Russian docking ports. I used the stock docking port for common berthing, and a port from I think it was Cosmos for Russian docking. So the PMA I'm using, of course, has one docking port of each type. Okay, now here comes the logistics. You can see everything was stacked one on top of the other for launch. What we want to achieve is this. They didn't start out that way because it was more stable to have the PMAs on top for the launch. The plan is to do this. First, we dock the top PMA to Zerya. Then we pull off the second PMA and Node 1. We put those under the station temporarily, which allows Node 1 to be placed into its position. Then we go back for the PMA. We use the space tug, we pull that down and attach that to the end. This is where shuttles would dock if this were a real ISS. Real Node 1 measures 5.5 meters long and over 4.5 meters in diameter. It's the hub of the station at this point. Miles and miles of fluid and electrical lines flow through here, and it will connect everything to everything all over the station as it grows bigger. This is what it looks like on the inside. What are those? Color-coded binders? Maybe all the systems on the station are detailed in there. In the back, it looked like the PMA from the inside, coated with storage bags of supplies. For my version, we're still reorienting the PMAs. The gyros on the space tug are so strong, it makes maneuvering quite easy, at least. One problem with the PMA we're doing next, though, is it's upside down relative to space. The tug needs to undock it from the station, undock from it and let it float in space, and then go around to the other side. Redock with it, and then we can get it on the end of Unity like it's supposed to be for future ship docking. Alright, it's done. Now, if I can just remember how to get out of here. Was I supposed to go left or right at that last corner? Uh-oh. Someone's coming. Hold it right there! Don't move! What are you doing in this section? This is off limits to all but authorized personnel. You're coming with us. Screen off. Bob, what's going on with the prisoner? We think his name is Joseph Kerman, a member of a radical anti-gateway coalition. We only have him on trespassing so far, so we can't hold him any longer. Okay, let him go. Alright, but I'm going to increase base security. Joseph Kerman, let's go, you're out. Don't think this means you're off the hook. We can't hold you, but we know you were up to something. We'll be watching you. So I had been working on a prototype station before this series. This was my first try at Azaria. It's upside down, so here, let me flip this over for you. I was not happy with this, so I started again. And when I started again, I decided to make this series at the same time to document construction. Here's the second version, which I was much happier with. But that said, if I had the time to go back and do it all again, I'd make a series about real construction, complete with real solar system, full-size modules, realism overhaul, real launchers including shuttles, the whole works. A part of me still really wants to do that actually, but I have so many series ideas that I'm trying to complete. 
However, before we can do anything else, we need to satisfy Bill Kerman. Remember, he demands no orbital debris, so this stage needs to deorbit. It's why we have avionics on board, and extra fuel to make the deorbit burn. One of my favorite things in KSP is watching stuff burn up and explode, and I was not dissatisfied with this one. Look at how this thing is exploding! Yeah, so good! All that's left behind is one little bit that splashes down in the ocean. We have two stages from the two different launches, and so we take care of both of those now. Unfortunately for the second one, I burned a lot of the fuel to slow down in order to re-enter way too much. If it had come in more shallow, it would have gone through the air for longer, but instead what happened with this one is it came in ballistically at a much steeper angle, but a lot slower. It didn't create as much of a shock wave, and so did not burn up as much. So if you're using something like deadly re-entry and you want to burn up, make sure you come in more shallow. Just skim through the top of the atmosphere as fast as you can. Speaking of tips, throughout this series, I'm going to use Kerbal Attachment System quite a bit. So here's a quick overview of some of the major features that were available to Kerbal Attachment System back when this was being made. Today, there are even more features available. I created a little setup here to demonstrate. We have a hatch that Jebediah can come out and show things. We have some boxes in the background that contain Kerbal Attachment System type things. We have a strut that I can use to show you how if you select the strut, you can go across to another strut, select that you want to link it, and then you can create struts in between two parts on the fly. The same thing works for pipes. They're a little bit thicker. They also allow for the transfer of fluids between those two connected parts once you have them linked. My containers and my container bays are grabbable. All the parts are grabbable. You can pick them up, use your back to just move them around to different places, and reattach them in new locations. In the case of the container bay, then I can go out on an EVA, put one where I need it, put a container box into that bay, and then store equipment inside the box. There was a slight problem with the bays wanting to sink too deeply inside the objects they were being attached to while doing an EVA, but they still function, so it's not too bad. You can go inside the boxes and grab whatever's in there. They have a certain amount of volume that each thing takes up. So for example, we can store lights inside because you gotta have more lights, and if there isn't enough lights, then you can get some out of your boxes as long as you've put some in before launch. Earlier when I launched that tug, I said that I had some cubic struts attached that I would be able to remove. Well, this is how I'll do it. Using Kerbal Attachment System, I can grab those. They'll go onto my bot back temporarily. Then I can move to something that's going to deorbit, maybe a box on a maybe a box on a rocket or an upper stage or something. Attach the strut to that stage or put it inside the box that's going to deorbit and then burn those things up in the atmosphere later like trash. Run out of battery power on something? Bring up a battery, attach it to it. Boom! New battery power. Need some life support supplies? Bring up a canister of life support. Attach that food, water, oxygen to the outside of whatever it is that needs the life support and simulate the idea of bringing up extra supplies. Did a solar panel break? Bring a solar panel. Pop it out of your box, attach it to the spaceship or the lander or whatever. Open up the solar panel and boom, you've got yourself some more power generation. I thought I was done and I checked on the station one last time, but I noticed the orientation of the PMA was off. It was rotated 90 degrees off center. So I undocked the tug, backed up, rotated, and redocked to fix it. It was pretty simple. But otherwise, everything was okay and we can move on. The next launch will be on another KLS-4. It's the Zvezda module. But you'll see that in the next episode. I'll leave you with a pretty view of what we have so far orbiting high above Kerbin. And until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.